Hi, in this video I want to have a look at glass. I'm going to return to this subject I think more than once but today I want to have a look at the relationship between its atomic scale structure, how the atoms are arranged within it and the sound that we might get out of it. We don't have to go far in our houses to find examples of glass, everything from window panes through um, the humble milk bottle, ornaments perhaps, tumblers, inexpensive wine glasses and the slightly grander ones. And they all have their own characteristics uh, and in particular they all have their own um, sounds. So the milk bottle for instance very dull. Um, also the tumbler, our cheap wine glass, maybe a little bit more noise from the posher wine glass. But if we're going to really look at the effect that the type of glass has on the sound that it makes, then we need examples of different glasses made into the same shapes. So here's, uh, here's the three stars of this video. These glasses were all made by a glass blower with different compositions, but as close as uh, he could manage the same sort of shape and thickness. So one made with a soda lime glass, that's the sort of glass that milk bottles and tumblers and so on are made of. A lead glass, so here we're into the slightly grander wine glass end of the spectrum, to this one at the end which is made from pure quartz. Let's start with the soda lime glass. And we'll move on to the lead crystal. And finally to the glass made from pure silica. Now, what I hope you could tell from that, even though of course this is going into a webcam microphone and through all the systems and out of whatever speakers you've got, so there is a little bit of distortion going on, but what I think we can tell fairly readily is that the soda lime glass has a fairly dull, almost dead sound. It doesn't really ring at all. Lead crystal, a lot clearer uh, as a note, and it goes on for a little while. But actually, hopefully, um, you'll notice that the pure silica glass had a very, very clear note um, and it seemed to ring for a few seconds after I'd um, set it going. And that's quite a profound difference between these three types of glass. And that's really what I want to um, explore in a, in a little bit more detail now as we look at how the atomic scale structure of these different glasses has such an effect on what they sound like. Well the first thing we need to um, teach ourselves I think is the basic arrangement of atoms in a glass. So I'm going to start first with this tetrahedrally shaped unit here. Now what this represents in a very simplistic form uh, is the basic building block of silica. And there's a silicon atom in the middle. In this particular model it's brown. And then there are four oxygen atoms attached to it, all at equal angles. So this is our basic tetrahedron. Now, if those are repeated in an identical fashion, one to the next to the next, we get something that looks a little bit like this. So they're all lined up this way, or they might be halfway in between. Doesn't matter. As long as it's all regular, it's going to be fine. Because that will just repeat and repeat and repeat in three dimensions. Uh, and we'll end up with a crystal. And in fact, we'll end up with a crystal of quartz. So here's a bit of quartz, um, quite a small piece, but hopefully it's enough 
to show you that it is a crystal. There are some very regular uh, faceted um, shapes here to this crystal structure. And it is a crystal just like diamond or salt. Uh, it's a crystal because the atoms within it, just like these, are arranged in a regular repeating fashion. Okay, now if we move from uh, a crystalline structure, then actually we don't have to do very much. All we have to do is to allow this to flex a little bit, so we get a slight angle between one of these units and the neighbouring one, or we can allow these to rotate a little bit. And by a little bit, I mean only five, maybe 10 degrees. So quite a small amount. But as soon as you've done that, you've taken away the regular three dimensional um, structure. And you've created something that is now not a crystal, but is amorphous. Uh, and actually, this, if we let it become amorphous, is not then quartz, it would actually be um, a silica glass. So all we've done to move from quartz to a glass is actually allow these small changes uh, in our arrangement of groups of atoms. OK, so that's well and good, but we need to um, discover a little bit more than that if we're going to understand the different sounds that we heard. The problem with making a glass out of pure silica, which actually is simply sand, um, the grains of sand on the beach are this sort of crystalline arrangement, uh, is that it takes a lot of energy. Uh, this stuff, sand, won't melt until we've got above about 1400 degrees centigrade. Uh, and that certainly for uh, earlier furnaces when people started making glass, and that's going back at least 5000 years, uh, was beyond their technological capability. But actually what they'd found, by happenstance or design, nobody really knows, uh, is that if you add atoms of sodium, then you can lower the melting temperature. And in fact, you can lower it dramatically down to just a few hundred degrees. And that was well within the um, uh, scope of early furnaces. Um, if we go a little bit further and we add calcium, then we not only get something that melts at a much lower temperature, but the calcium means that it uh, become remains workable over a much, much wider range of temperatures. So in other words, we can mould it or blow it or, you know, make any of the shapes that we need to make. Uh, out of our glass. Um, and these two things came from ingredients in nature that we would know of as soda and lime. So seaweed, chalk, all sorts of stuff could go into um, providing these ingredients. So it's not surprising then um, that a common or garden glass became referred to as a soda lime glass. And actually this is the formulation at the heart of pretty much all the early uh, glassware. So things like, you know, beer bottles, drinking glasses, and still things like, you know, milk bottles and, and so on and so forth, all made out of a soda lime glass. Um, now we begin to get to the slightly more interesting stuff in terms of sound. So if I try and translate this into a two-dimensional diagram, 
So I'm going to take this um, amorphous version, disordered version of this uh, first to create our silica glass. Let's try and represent what I've said so far with two dimensional drawings. So if we've got our oxygen atoms in a silica glass, they're not all arranged in a, a regular fashion, remember, this is now not a crystalline material. Um, they're arranged in some, well, it's not random, but it's a disordered fashion. And on each of those silicon atoms, we're going to have oxygen atoms. Um, so on average, we're going to have uh, oxygen atoms either bridging to other silicon atoms or just sitting out there in, in space, as it were. Um, and these oxygen atoms are actually going to play a big role in this because what they do essentially is tie this whole um, structure together. Um, and in fact they do it extremely efficiently. So we end up with um, an arrangement whereby all of these atoms are actually linked together um, into a very rigid structure. Right? You have to imagine this in three dimensions. It actually locks everything together. So that gives us, as I say, something that's rigid. Now, what happens if we come along and spoil this a little bit by putting in um, sodium atoms that we've done to lower the melting temperature of this thing, or perhaps uh, we're going to add calcium in there as well. Um, doesn't have to be very much of it, it's a few, uh, a few percent we'll add into there. These don't bond in quite the same way to the network. And in fact, what they tend to do is to create channels through the glass, uh, which disrupt this rigid network. It actually makes it slightly more floppy. Uh, and that's a, you know, that's not a good thing. Um, an intermediate to this is going to be almost impossible for me to draw because I run out of colours apart from anything else. Uh, but we could put in some very large atoms to this. We could actually put in um, some lead, for instance, um, in place of some of these other metallic things that I've, I've dropped into my glass. And these, of course, are both big and massive. And between them, these little representations here will, I hope, tell us why we've had the different sounds from our, uh, from our different glasses. So what we've ended up with then is a very rigid, um, pure silica glass. And if I pinged that, you remember, it, um, it rang very clear and actually the vibrations carried on for a few seconds afterwards. And that's because it is this rigid structure. There's actually um, a very small number of ways in which the vibrations can be damped down uh, in the glass. If we add calcium and sodium, so now we've moved from our silica glass uh, to a soda lime glass, we've actually put a lot of light things that are fairly mobile. They can actually move around in these channels in the glass. And that gives us a lot more mechanism now for absorbing the sound energy. And that's why the soda lime glass at the other end of the spectrum sounded so dull. It's because 
all of these light atoms in here are actually uh, taking this energy, absorbing this energy. The intermediate one, uh, you'll remember, was the lead glass. And it's intermediate because the metal atoms that are sitting within this silica network are so big, so heady, actually they don't pick up quite so much of the sound energy, the vibrational energy, and dampen it out. So we have this intermediate state here where there is a relatively clear sound, but it doesn't go on for as long as it does in the pure silicon. Silica, rather. So hopefully that explains for you why um, when you flick your finger against uh, a cheap glass it will sound very dull. If you look at a lead crystal glass it's a lot clearer. It makes a much better sound when you ping it. But were you able to produce your glassware out of pure silica, which is unlikely, because um, it's very hard to work with, as I said earlier, um, you would get the clearest of sounds which would carry on uh, resonating for some considerable time. So that's it, the sound of glass. Bye for now.